No, it felt fresh and new to me. And things that are fresh and new are not given to you. Things that are fresh and new are things you have to go after. I prepared for this meeting in ways that I don't normally prepare for meetings because I wanted it. I wanted this part. I wanted to play this guy. Thank you guys for coming out here tonight. Um, it's really special that you can be here, especially after um, there was great news for SAG after our last week after the strike. But um, Memory, um, you received an interim agreement to um, promote the film, so you were even able to attend the Venice Film Festival, where Peter, you won the um, Best Actor Award. <laughs> So what, was that a strange experience heading to that festival under such unusual conditions? Yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, I was, you know, speaking with a lot of my friends who were um, working in the, it, with SAG-AFTRA and the negotiating committee and, and whatnot. So I made sure that the interim agreement was something that was very helpful to our um, fight for a fair contract, and it was that they wanted us to show up in Venice. So when I got my talking points and I got my orders of, of what to do um, in support of SAG, I was very happy to be there. But it was, it was a scary situation um, to be one of the first out there. But I, I'm, gl I'm glad we did it. Yeah, I had uh, three films uh, at Venice. Two of them had interim agreements. Um, I would just even say that many of my friends are actors and hadn't been working for a long time. And even just talking to them about what I was doing is like a little bit uncomfortable, saying, oh, I'm going to Venice. <laughs> Shut up, Peter. <laughs> um, so, you know, I had to kind of tamper. It seemed like a big deal that I had three films in Venice. Normally a very exciting time, but like, and, and I particularly loved this film and so happy to support it, but but yeah, um, it felt a little out of uh, the context of what we were all going through. Um, Peter, I'm always curious how it works when you win an award at a festival. Like, are you leaving? Are you heading out of Venice and somebody tells you, like, you need to come back because the award ceremony, you know, is on the last day? Yeah, I was actually told, so my other film that had an interim agreement was called Coup. That one screened and then I had like an hour off on Friday and then memory was gonna screen and I was coming out of that one and Michelle called me and said, you're gonna have to stay another day. They want you to stay another day. And he said, you know what that means? And uh, I was, it was so out of left field for me that it, I was like, no, what does that mean? <laughs> um, and my wife had just won best screenplay like two years before there. So I damn well knew what that meant. And I immediately just started thinking about what I wanted to say. And I really, I really wanted to say something about our experience as actors and talk about AI, but not just AI as an abstract concept, but that our job as actors is about humanity, is about connection, is about interaction between people. And I just was like, okay, I'm gonna try to articulate something and they don't have a timer that cuts you off. <laughs> so I didn't worry about that. And I spent the Saturday just, just writing it down. Uh, well, it was a really great speech. I, I was not in Venice for that part, but I watched it on uh, YouTube later and was very moved by it. Um, I would really like to ask about your first um, impressions and conversations with director Michelle Franco and Jessica, maybe if you want to start. This is a filmmaker who's known for making really confrontational, provocative movies. His, I mean, New Order is about like an apocalyptic uprising. You have After Lucia, which is like a high school bullying revenge drama. Um, this is a different kind of film that almost feels like the aftermath of what a Michel Franco film tends to be. So uh, yeah, what was your relationship to his work um, prior to first talking to him? And what was what were those conversations like? I loved his, I love his work. Uh, I find him to be a very rebellious filmmaker in that he kind of goes against expectations of what a, how a story should be told. And in both the films you mentioned, he, you really don't know exactly where it's going. And as I was reading this script, 
I thought I knew once the, the park scene happened. I thought, okay, this is in response to the Me Too era. This is a revenge drama. You know, but as I read each page I turned, I realized he is completely devoid of any type of cliche or expectation. Uh, and I was so moved to see that it was actually about healing, about this this woman who could not walk into a room without shame, her shame leading her and her past leading her and to meet someone who sees her in each moment new and fresh, just in that moment, not for where she came from and how because of the way he sees her, she can learn how to see herself in that way. I was so moved by that. And that's also a rebellious way of telling the story um, in some sense because it's not the expected way you would. I love working with him. We've done another film together. Uh, I hope to work with him many times. It's a dream for an actor. It's a super low budget. I went to Target, got my own costumes, did my own hair. <laughs> <laughs> but it was an absolute dream collaboration, working with Peter and working with Michelle and all the incredible actors in New York. Um, and Peter, what can you say about the first time you met with Michelle? We met at Russ and Daughters Appetizers. I'm sure many of you know where that is. I was trying to like give him a tour of New York, and I figured that's where I would start anyway. Um, and I used to live on the Lower East Side, so we kind of walked around down there, and his sister was around. She kind of split off early on, and we walked for like two hours and um, just chatted about all kinds of things. I really wanted the part. I mean, I would say for me, most of the things I end up doing these days feel like kind of reinforce old things I've done. Okay, so I'm playing a district attorney again, or I'm playing a killer again, or I'm, I know those don't go together, but like, um, <clears throat> but um, maybe they do. <laughs> See, United States. Um, <laughs> oh dear. No, no, it felt fresh and new to me. And things that are fresh and new are not given to you. Things that are fresh and new are things you have to go after. I prepared for this meeting in ways that I don't normally prepare for meetings because I wanted it. I wanted this part. I wanted to play this guy. I felt his hunger. I knew him. I, he felt an inch away from me. You know, and when acting, I could tell it would be easy. And that doesn't mean like it requires nothing. It just meant like, oh, I'll just start here and slide down it, you know. So, uh, can you, do you want to share an example of, again, you, how you say you prepared for this in a way you don't normally? What was kind of. Well, I prepared for the meeting in a way that I don't normally. I mean, for the meeting, I watched like, I'd seen After Lucia, so I watched all the other movies that I could get my hands on. I think I read the script twice, and um, I think I read a little bit about him. I might have watched interviews with him. Um, I mean, that's the way you get a part. You know, you really go at it from every angle. Um, well, and then, of course, the, the you shot the movie like almost like a year and a half ago, I think. It was in May of, of 2002, and you were shooting in and around New York, and the movie was really kind of veiled in secrecy. There was not... I mean, I just, I didn't know anything about it until that first, like those first couple press screenings, like at the Venice Film Festival, which is, it's hard to keep a movie with, you know, high profile actors under wraps like that. Um, and you had a kind of bit of a guerrilla style of shooting that, you know, was extremely independent in its ethos. Um, how would you characterize what that shoot was like? Well, we couldn't, you know, block off streets or do anything like that. We really used New York as a character. I mean, we'd be shooting things it was so exciting. I can't like the crew was we were we were all working together on it. So we'd be shooting something and if there were a lot of people in the area observing or bystanders that were kind of looking at the camera, the crew members would then get in the shot and and pretend to be extras and block the other people. <laughs> Uh, and they would just keep rotating in and out. It was so exciting. And um, I mean, I loved it. Sometimes we had paparazzi show up. But after, we were just talking about this upstairs, I mean, after a half hour of getting our pictures, I just go up to them and be like, guys, you got it. Please leave us alone now. And so it was really, um, it helped us really fall into the, the world of the characters. My first day of shooting was 
I showed up at a church, went to this basement, and it was an actual AA meeting, which that shocked me. I didn't understand the type of immersion that uh, Michelle has. It really means when you show up in a situation like that, you're like, I don't want to look like the actor in this room. So how am I? How do I make sure I'm Sylvia from the moment I step in and the moment the camera, the the scenes of the um, adult daycare center. I worked there, <laughs> you know, Rich and all those guys that were living there knew me as Sylvia and I made their lunch and helped, you know, we played games together and and got them to the bus and helped them with their jackets. All these things just became part of Sylvia's world. And it's that's very rare for an actor to get that experience. We're usually separated in some sense from any type of authenticity by like trailers and we're waiting for lighting and this wasn't that at all. It really was from the moment you arrived on set, you needed to prepare to be filmed. I would even say in the way that he films, we were put together. We were never separated by shots. You were never off camera for another person. All of the shots in this movie, most of them, 99% are oneers. The scene is so the camera's put over in the corner somewhere and you act over there. And um, sometimes your back's to camera, sometimes your head is cut off. <laughs> but like, um, I knew my head was cut off. I'm going to say that. Um, <laughs> but but it, it makes it so that we are given power as actors. I'm telling you, each and every one of you would love this. It's like, it's... It's, it's what you dream about doing as an actor. You know, you're given so much power over things like tempo in a scene. He can't intercut that scene to make it faster or slower. It's just how it is, you know. Um, well, and to that point, the movie has a really enviable cast of actors. Um, Merritt Weaver, Elsie Fisher, Josh Charles. One person I'd really like to know about working with is Jessica Harper, who is um, an icon from Dario Gento's Suspiria. Um, and I felt like with this movie, if you need to get a mother who is like a piece of work, like she seemed like a great person to get on the horn. Yeah, it's, it's tough because I love Suspiria. I love Jessica Harper. But after we shot that scene, I just cannot look at her face ever again. I just can't. She's so good in this film. And she was so great in that scene she just kept like blocking me from the ca from the camera you know she, in her red sweater and she was just kind of hovering over me we we didn't really know what we were going to do in the scenes the actors really had free reign and she just took over that space in a way that at the end when i stand up and scream get the fuck away from me <laughs> that was not in the script <laughs> she provoked that kind of reaction her, there's something about her hands, right? Like she's got, she really, there's some great hand acting going on there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, like M Michelle has talked about like some some scenes that you need 10 takes, some you need 25. Like what was, how long did that scene take to put together? It seemed like there just, there's a lot of emotions at play in that moment. Yeah. That was a long day. I mean, we, the wonderful thing about Michelle is because you don't have, there's no continuity. Every scene you start just new. And he, that means he can move the camera from take to take. He can say, mm, I pr you move it to the side. Or he'd say, don't say this paragraph. Or he'd say, I'd like you to say this instead. Every take, it's, it's alive and new and you're discovering it. And um, that was a long day of discovery, I think, that scene. I don't know what take he ended up using, but we went for a while. Yeah, I mean, I just stood behind you. <laughs> it's interesting when you're acting in a scene like that where there's a lot of stuff going on, right? And you're not really an active participant in it. It's a lot like how the character feels, right? Like, am I supposed to be here? If I am here, I should indicate where my loyalty lies. And yet I would want her to fight her own battles, but not too much. You know, it's just like all those things that go through your head. <laughs> well, um, you know, Jessica, you talked a little bit about your immersion to play Sylvia, but Peter, what about for Saul? I mean, it's kind of a, I felt like it's a different view of dementia than we're seeing in movies and that he's sort of snapping in and out of focus. Yeah, I mean, it, well, first of all, um, my uncle, God rest him, um, had CTE. 
and he was a uh, center for LSU. He was a very talented football player and boxer, and of course, that's where that leads. But he had dementia quite young. Um, I mean, sure, everyone has dementia before it's diagnosed, so that's there's that period where everyone just kind of ignores it or calls it something else. And and I was really interested in those early moments. I think this guy has been labeled as having dementia for not that long. I think the people around me have reacted like I'm about to die from it, including my brother. And um, I really liked that the character, I, what I really wanted, inspired by my uncle largely, was the character not be his condition. I was not dementia. I was a guy, had this thing, but he was just like, you know, I've got a half hour left, what do you want to do, mm -hmm. you know? And I found that really charming about him and, and, that, and that he always put the attention on someone else, you know? It was just like, I, I fell in love with the character. So I also worked with this doctor here in New York named Dr. Whitehouse, who is peripherally part of a group called Reimagining Dementia. And this is a group that works with families and with patients, with people who have dementia, because that all kinds of goes together, right? Like people mirroring back at you, if they're mirroring back sick all the time or can't remember, your life's gonna suck. You know, like there has to be some dance amongst family members. And so he, he put me in touch with these people who had dementia, both of them were around my age, and I would just talk to them on the phone because there is that awkward thing as an actor where you're like, hi, I'm here at your house to study your problem. <laughs> you know, that's, that's no fun. And so the phone made it a lighter touch and actually just as valuable. And what I really learned from both of these guys, reinforced what I'd seen with my uncle, is that every case is an individual case. And most of what we've seen in movies either is very late stage or referencing other movies in a way that we've all gotten used to sort of dementia acting or something. And I thought this was really an opportunity also to set that straight because I think that's a very important thing to do so that we don't dismiss people before they're gone. Um, no, and, and the way that Saul is kind of constantly refreshing in a way, and like living very much in the present, it's almost like that's the only person really that Sylvia could be with, in a sense. It's, it's like she's really trying to untether herself from her past. Absolutely, he frees her in some way. Um, Jessica, you alluded to um, this other movie that you shot with Michelle, uh, I believe it's called Dreams, um, and you were able to shoot it during the strike, and I know he keeps his projects very close to his chest, but I don't know what you can say about that, or, you know, the fact that I think you had like a hundred something crew, cast and crew that you shot it with, like there were, you know, there were a lot of people uh, that were involved. If Michelle was here, he would say, I can't say anything about this film. This is, this conversation is all about memory. <laughs> so, um, I mean, just like I, when you were talking about how uh, tightly lipped this film was, I remember looking at IMDb at one point and it said that the film memory was about a staycation in New York City. <laughs> Oh, and he gave it a pretend title. What was the title that we, it was a Spanish title every day. I was like, is that the movie we're doing? I was like, a staycation, a Michelle Franco, this is the Michelle Franco staycation, I guess. So I can't really say anything about that, but, um, but yeah, he, we've, he's already talked to me about his other ideas and it's so incredible to work with a filmmaker who the, the ideas for a film, it starts with him. You know, he it's at conception. He has the idea. He writes the script. He's he's in every step of the way. It really is. But he is not a perfectionist. No. And he's like, he wants. He has an idea. He writes it down. He makes the film. He wants to come out. He has another idea. He wants to do that one. He's not like somebody who comes up with an idea. It takes six years to write the yeah. script. Like shoots the movie, and now they're like, what was that idea? He's really. I Shoots think it's a movie a year. Yeah, I think he might beat Fassbender. We're, we're uh, going to see what happens. One thing I wanted to ask was the fact that um, you guys are kind of all over New York in this movie, and uh, there's places that I think a lot of us maybe haven't seen and that maybe you weren't so familiar with. I mean, what were some of your discoveries that you made as Michelle is taking you to all these places in New York? 
well, Sylvia's apartment was fantastic. I, above the tire shop. I think that was the actual apartment of the production designer or this uh, set who, dresser, maybe? Yes, yeah, somebody. No, no, no. Locations. Location. Okay. So we were, but it was also like when we would go in, and Aaron Deere is our producer, everyone. Aaron Deere. Uh, we would go in to shoot, and it was a lived in <laughs> space. So there was, I mean, again, it, everything just felt so authentic. And uh, I just, I loved the locations that we shot in. Yeah, I mean, his idea of production design is we got the brownstone that my character lives in. He went in, and there was um, a rowing machine in there, like, on, he said, I'll get rid of that, and the rest looks good. <laughs> um, and including, and this is a, a thing that I, I've always felt really strongly in the film, and I think for audiences it might be subliminal, but my wife is a big thing in my head in the movie, and there is a moment where she's going through a photo album from that house, and there's a redhead in the one of the frames. With your face on the picture. Yeah, my face put next to hers. That is the deceased wife of the guy who owned the house. So, you know, if you do production like that, sometimes there's like an interesting kind of kismet, right, available to you. It uh, looks like I think we have a question over here. I'm having trouble asking. Oh, I'm having trouble asking the personal, the professional question. But I've got. First of all, did you write anything in the notepad? Did you write anything through the time? Yeah. His notepad. Yeah. Did I write anything in the notepad? Right. Did you make notes as character? Oh yeah. That was just really interesting. No, to me, all the like, time. All I like, even practiced doing it in my life to just sort of get used to doing it. Like you, know, because there's an awkward moment when you do that, right? There's yeah. this thing where it's like you someone's you talking it. to you. <laughs> like, hang on. Let me write down what you're saying or what you just said. So getting used to dealing with it in a social situation is is an aspect of it. And then lighting, was everything set before you guys set foot normally or did they do a lot of changes through? That was really interesting to me. See, some of the lighting choices were really strong, intense choices. Was that, uh, was that organic through the day or was it mostly you came onto set with it squared away? The cinematographer, Eve, is a genius and I've never worked with someone who, wor who he's so fast uh, that you almost feel like, I, when you ask that question, I'm like, there wasn't any lighting. But of course there's lighting in the in this film. And um, But they he he's just kind of a, a genius with how everything's set up. So I know he and uh, Michelle talk a lot about where we're shooting and, and, but they don't know necessarily until we're all together where the scene's gonna take place. Yeah, they take it from us. Yeah. And, and uh, they always work together. So they have this way of shooting that is like, almost like a dogma, you know, like no coverage, very simple, certain type of frame. But um, I had actually worked with Eve 20 something years ago. I did a film that my wife, who I just met, has a small part in. And there was a problem with the camera that nobody knew about and it was not Eve's fault, so much so that we got all the insurance money back after the whole thing was shot out of focus. We shot it for seven weeks, and I played a, yeah, I know. I forget I'm talking to actors who are just like, ah! Um, you know what? It was street theater in the end. It's fine. It's, um, the crew got to see me do it. But, um, but that was, when I heard he was on it, I was like, it felt like a real opportunity to heal something, you know? But also, in one way, how genius he is. The, like the intimate scene between the characters, that was one take. Wow. The bathtub scene, one take. So he really, it, and Michelle and Eve together set up the environment for the actors to show up, not really know exactly what we're gonna do, figure it out in the rehearsal, which they, we film, and then if he has it, he goes, okay, let's move on. Yeah, yeah the intimate scene is the rehearsal. Uh, we could take the next question. Yes, how long did it take to shoot? Six weeks, Erin Deer? Yeah. And Six just weeks. one math question, what was the budget? I'm just was it, curious. Oh, are we allowed to say? It's, it's lower than you think. <laughs> it's probably, it's a little more than that. Two, five? It's around three. It's around three. three. Okay, three. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we have one more question. 
You both did such beautiful work. Me and my best friend Quinn were sobbing and gasping the whole time. Um, but I just wanted to ask if Michelle, if he tells you what the frame is going to be before, if you know where exactly you're going to be, and if you adjust your work to if it's like a medium or a close up or anything like that, or if that's conscious thought at all. He doesn't really plan the shots in that way. He'll kind of talk to us about the scene, figure out what would the characters be doing. And then like Peter made the joke about being a de decapitated head, but like the scene where my character shows up to apologize, we did it and he kind of figured out where the camera was, but when Peter was standing up, it meant that it was just kind of focused on me and it was just his body. And when he sat down, then it's on his back. So there's a way that he shoots, you don't really, you don't play for the camera, he'll just find an interesting place for the camera to be that focuses the eye of the viewer. Because usually you focus the eye of the viewer in post with editing, and he's figured out a way to, how to do it on set in his shots worth where he wants the camera to be. It's incredible. Yeah, I mean, if you're a theater actor and you're the camera, you know, you tend to kind of want to do this, you know. <laughs> you have to just, you don't want to do that, is, is a quick answer to that question. Like, you know, you could get curious. He certainly is like, do you want to come look at the shot? Do you want to come look at the take? Do you, the, they're editing in the basement. <laughs> so, and it's being shot largely in order. Yeah. So he just drops the scene in and he'll be like, do you want to come look at how the scene sits and the whole thing? I never did because I'm... I don't even look at mirrors, you know. <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, all right, well, thank you so much for coming out and chatting with us. Thank you, guys.